I call this first budget study session to order and note that all board members are present, along with Dr. Patrick and members of his cabinet. And I will turn things over to Dr. Patrick to lead us through this session. Okay, thank you, Amber. Um, I'd like to start our presentation tonight by taking a moment to thank Stuart Matty and Lisa Zareski for mountains of behind the scenes work in preparation for this budget study session and, and the ones to come. Uh, as you know, we're in a period of transition in the business office. Lisa's arrival over the summer has lent a fresh perspective to our work. And since she started, she has been asking excellent questions about our approaches and our practices and offering suggestions for improvement. For his part, Stuart has encouraged and supported Lisa and has embraced these questions and suggesting suggestions, helping us to, to move forward with our processes. I'm happy to report that the three of us um, have worked really well together um, to arrive at this first proposed budget for 2023-24. I also want to thank Cabinet and our entire Administrative Council for their efforts to identify priorities and engage in authentic dialogue around how best to achieve our goals for students. This work, fueled by input from faculty, staff, and our community, contributes significantly to what you will see and hear tonight. Before we dig in, I want to um, take a second to set the stage for you, for the board here, by framing a few factors that we expect will foster dialogue with respect to this in initial budget proposal. First, of course, is the fact that we've been discussing the renovation of the Scarsdale High School Auditorium. We will present you tonight with budget numbers that include the auditorium, as well as numbers that exclude this project. And we know that you'll have additional questions, which we look forward to discussing. You will also note that we have not produced our typical budget book for tonight's meeting. Given the variety of possible directions that the budget may take, we judged it best to hold off on the full budget book until we're closer to a likely direction. And uh, that's an, uh, an efficiency for us, allowing us to focus on um, as many possibilities as we need to. We've shared the financial information along with projected enrollments and staffing, both of which are attachments uh, in the board docs. And for those in the audience, we have them uh, on your honor. Second, our proposed budgets tonight come in above the allowable tax levy. We will present some of the ways we might shrink the gap between the proposed budget and the allowable levy but we, we may also want to discuss the viability of a budget plan proposal that exceeds the tax cap and what implications that may have. And finally, one of the strategies for reducing the gap between the proposed budget and the levy limit is to strategically apply reserves to lower the tax levy. We will probably want to discuss some of the factors that would uh, influence the decision to apply reserves and at what levels, okay? So with that said, uh, on to the presentation, which we've divided more or less into six parts that you can see here. Uh, we're going to talk about the why of our budget, the how of our budget, the what. Then we will have uh, some component presentations, uh, transportation, debt service, employee benefits, and athletics. And we will have some considerations for reductions from what we originally propose, and then talk about next steps in the process. Okay, um, above all, our budget is a means to an end. In the broadest terms, the essential work of our schools is to provide a world-class education, ensuring our students are well prepared for their next level of education. We're also increasingly concerned with the importance of student well-being and recognize that our work must contemplate ways we can help our youngsters to be good at learning and good at life. Uh, while the concept of educating the whole child has long been a core value in Scarsdale, the novel challenges brought about by the increasing presence of technology in our lives, and especially social media, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic, have caused us to deepen our focus on what it means to be successful and what we can do uh, in and outside the classroom to help our students flourish. These broad objectives serve as, important as an important decision-making lens for us uh, especially with respect to the budget. Uh, you've seen this slide before. It's one of the ways to view how we are organized in the district. And tonight we're going to present detail on four particular areas, athletics up there in the teaching and learning area, and the three in the district operations, transportation, debt service, and employee benefits. 
Um, and just as a quick reminder, uh, our major staffing drivers at our three levels are uh, long-time, long-standing things. Class sizes at the elementary school, our house and team model at the middle school, and our course offerings uh, at the high school. So just to put that in front of you again. And then, of course, um, we've got priorities for the current year, connecting our wide community. That's a lens for our thinking about what comes before you in terms of a budget, as well as the ongoing work of uh, goals related to the strategic plan. Uh, tonight's study session comes on the heels of our staffing presentation earlier in January. And uh, the next slides just simply summarize the key elements of our process and the guiding principles behind our recommendations. And we will remind you what those recommendations were as part of this process. Um, and just as a reminder, this is the first of three budget study sessions. Here's our budget calendar, discussion calendar. Um, so tonight will be followed by um, our March 6th and March 20th budget study sessions, a regular uh, budget forum and review on March 27th, and a hoped for uh, board adoption of the budget uh, on April 17th. Okay. So on to, <clears throat> um, well, first, for those in our audience who might be newer to this particular process, uh, we thought it might be helpful just to uh, distinguish between the major building blocks of our budget process, which this slide does. We have on uh, one hand, we have our expenditures. Uh, we start with analyzing the current year, our student needs, programs, and spending. We examine and project designated and undesignated fund balances. We assess major drivers, new programming, health, safety, salary, benefits, all that, all that stuff. We look at our revenues. We start with an analysis of the current year. We examine and project revenues out to next and assess uh, need or use of fund balance in that part of the conversation. Specifically, the fund balance, a reminder, we have designated and undesignated uh, reserves. And we uh, apply the targeted use of fund balance uh, primarily in an effort to smooth out year-to-year -year variations when they occur. And then the fourth factor we think about is the tax levy limit. And we'll talk about all, all of these things as we, as we go forward. OK. Um, so again, on to what we think the budget we're pro proposing tonight accomplishes. So we're going to start with what we think the budget does and then get into the numbers after that. So we're going to ask you to keep these things in mind as we walk through the draft budget plan. And Edgar will begin with the accomplishments. Sure. I'm happy to give some high-level comments about how this budget maintains high-quality teaching and learning. Importantly, it supports the academic and student-centered elements of the strategic plan and all the teaching and learning initiatives. This budget ensures that educational staffing levels are consistent with current and historical philosophies and community expectations. It also supports and energizes the well-being and belonging work through the enrichment of curriculum and the engagement of new social-emotional learning approaches, important work that attends to the whole child. We continue with the strategic implementation of the tools, resources, and professional learning support for the second year rollout of Reveal Math at the elementary level. Uh, in the area of instructional technology, this budget provides and maintains the devices, tools, and infrastructure necessary for technology-supported teaching and learning experiences. Next slide. Uh, in an opening and increasingly connected world, this budget improves, expands, and reimagines authentic global opportunities. It supports the researching, exploring, and implementation of sustainability projects through collaboration across community and schools. Many ideas of late are coming from our students. It also funds essential and responsive partnerships with educational institutions, trainers, and expert organizations to fortify and inspire professional learning for educators. This budget continues important funding of the arts through visiting artists to share expertise and inspire our students. And it continues support for special education programs, uh, including the 8 to 1 to 2 program and the emotional disabilities program at the middle school. The budget also continues to support our DEI initiatives and to continue to engage in consultants to help us with this work and curriculum resources that promote multiple perspectives and diverse representations. Uh, it continues to elevate our focus on social emotional support of students and in particular increasing support for our elementary age students in this arena and advances uh, in-district opportunities for students with disabilities which is a long-standing 
uh, trend that we've had to try to make sure we are able to provide high quality specialized instruction for our students and uh, make sure we are continuing to support the expanded continuum of services that we've been able to provide uh, along with our committee on preschool special education uh, processes. Um, Stuart, you want to take this one? Um, this budget improves wireless connectivity and communication systems, so it expands the range of Wi-Fi on both of our athletic fields, uh, and then a little bit beyond that as well. Uh, it continues to elevate our district cleaning standards and coverage specifically at the high school. It does fund uh, a new financial and HR software uh, package, which we have spoken about um, in previous board meetings. It improves and upgrades facilities with a focus on the renovation of the high school auditorium, uh, both building infrastructure, and also funds uh, studies for a shared uh, fields study and um, an updated roof study. And it does include funding for a comprehensive transportation study as we think about transportation in the upcoming decade and beyond. And Carol's gonna just give us a quick reminder of what we had come forward with in the January meeting. Sure, so um, in January, we first um, shared the staffing recommendations presented on this slide here. Um, in the area of student support services, we've requested funding um, for consultants who will be focusing in the area of social emotional learning um, at the elementary school. Um, and this would allow us to align um, the work taking place at the secondary level that has been funded already. Um, we've also requested a part-time position for a chairperson for the Committee of Preschool Education. That is tied, I'd just like to draw your attention to the administrative position because there's a little bit of reconfiguration in student support services that would take place. Um, so tied to that part-time CPSE chairperson, we would like to convert one position that is currently a CSE chair to the, an administrative position. So it's a budget neutral request. We would ask that um, it would no longer be a teaching position, but would be in the administrative unit, which would allow this person to conduct um, staff observations, evaluations, things like that. Um, on the operational side, um, we have requested a full-time custodial position at the high school. Um, this position would have a slightly different schedule. We'd be able to cover the building on weekends, so it would be a Tuesday to Saturday schedule. Um, and then the office, that you'll see that right now we have, as our department secretaries, aides in several of these positions. Um, this particular aide is retiring. We'd like to replace her with an office clerk, um, an eight-month office clerk. Um, that allows us to align the work to the position. So um, right now, teacher aides should not be doing clerical support work. So again, by hiring an aide, that would allow us um, to put the work in the proper title. And then lastly, um, we you know, had mentioned uh, three contingency positions, and those are in the budget, should um, our enrollments increase, um, you know, we have uh, any needs that we haven't planned for. So it's, that's it. Thank you. So um, now we'll turn to the draft budget plan. Um, just because we're doing this a little bit differently, uh, we're just gonna let you know what's coming your way, and then we'll do it, and then we'll uh, reflect back on it. So we are going to share with you a preliminary draft that includes the auditorium project, and essentially all of the detail that we have in this particular presentation is detail that includes the auditorium project. But we will also show you a preliminary draft at a high level of what the budget looks like without the auditorium, then we will go through our um, specific component presentations, uh, transportation, athletics, employee benefits, and so forth. After that, we will come back and share a revised draft that includes the auditorium project along with some targeted reductions 
and applications of fund balance to shrink the gap between the proposed budget and the tax uh, levy limit, and then a similar budget without the auditorium. So it sounds like a lot is coming at you, but um, we think this is the best way to kind of kind of paint the picture of where we are. And I will turn it over to Stuart. Thank you very much, Drew. Um, so as we do uh, every year when we start to look at the year ahead, we have to take a look at the current year and where we are uh, at the moment and what we project uh, for end of the year finances and fund balance. Um, so this is the projected fund balance. You can see at the top row is our ending fund balance from last year, uh, just about $24.8 million. Um, what we do to get the projected fund balance then for the, up, or for the current year is we would take our projected year-end revenues uh, from this year. You can see right now we are projecting that to be about $172.5 million. We add that, and we, then we take away our projected year-end expenditures, uh, which is about $175.6 million. Um, and when you add those three together, we got our resulting uh, projected end-of-the-year fund balance uh, at $21.7 million. Uh, that is the fund balance, projected fund balance in total. Then how is that to be allocated? Uh, right now we're proposing uh, as follows. Uh, tax tertiary reserve, about $4.2 million. Uh, the self-insured health insurance reserve, uh, $4.2 million. And you'll see on the next page that's down from where it was uh, uh, at the end of this past year. A debt service reserve of $217,000. Uh, we do have two uh, retirement reserves. Uh, the... New York State Public Employees Retirement System, that's the ERS, and then also the TRS, or Teachers Retirement System, uh, adding those both together, about $4.7 million, and a reserve for encumbrances of about a half a million dollars, that's a projection. Unassigned fund balance um, of $6.7 million, that's that 4% we hear about of the prospective year's pro uh, overall budget. Uh, right now that's about 3.65% of that total budget. Uh, keep in mind that auditorium expenditure is in that budget because uh, we're working off of that proposal so that number is a little bit lower as if that auditorium was not in the budget. It would be about 10 basis points different. And then we are putting in an assigned fund balance of $1.1 .1 million, which is sort of normalizing uh, from what we've had in the past few years when we've increased that due to uh, COVID contingencies. Overall, you can see that when you add all of those up, $21.716 million. Um, if we go to the next slide, I can talk about some of the drivers with these. So there's a historical going back uh, a few years. And you can see if we take the most recent year uh, from, was that 10 months or eight months ago, um, the assigned fund balance again, getting that back down to a normalized level from 2019. Tax tertiary reserve of these, as these have become settled, we've been able to drop that uh, drop that number as our uh, anticipated liabilities decrease. Our self-funded uh, health insurance reserve um, dropping by about a million dollars. Uh, we do plan on using a million dollars in the current year, so you'll see that at this point. We plan on you seeing that before June 30th as a transfer from the reserve into our regular budget to offset uh, claims increases, one-time claims increases that we've seen this year. Uh, so you should anticipate seeing that. We'll keep you up to date as we get closer uh, to see if that number holds true. But right now that will be the projection. Uh, the debt service reserve at $217,000. Uh, you might ask why isn't that higher if we're possibly using money for the auditorium? Right now, those funds are in the capital um, capital fund. Uh, we would need a transfer from the capital fund into the debt service reserve and able to allocate that to a future project. Um, so depending on conversations with um, the Board of Education, the direction, um, if you wanted to add the auditorium as part of the budget, um, we would recommend a transfer at some point. Uh, again, before the end of the year to get that into the proper place. Uh, next is are those two retirement reserves, a TRS and ERS. Uh, the reserve for encumbrances, you'll notice that that is uh, much lower than what it has been in the past. It's been a concentrated effort in the business office led by Lisa, uh, Linda uh, Pisano, who's the purchasing agent, and myself, and then also assistance from Bing Miller, who's our accounts payable clerk or bookkeeper. 
and really closing out and going through those one by one by one um, to see if those any single PO is still should be open or should be closed. Um, so uh, we we're able to reduce that by quite a bit. The net effect is generally the, the same, but it drops down more immediately to the fund balance and gets it perhaps into um, a different reserve or are able to assign it to a different purpose. Uh, and you can see um, our fund end of the year fund balance is projected to be about $3 million less than this past year. Uh, Drew mentioned one of the variables that we have to consider and certainly be aware of is the tax cap calculation. Uh, so this, we haven't typically shown this, but we have um, these variables uh, playing an impact on where our tax uh, levy limit uh, percent in dollar amount is landing um, as we look towards next year's budget. Uh, so this is a formula. It's um, you know pro forma in New York State um, since 2012, 13, or actually 2013, 14 budget. So just about 10 years. Um, and the formula is seemingly straightforward, but it can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. Um, so you can see that top line is the current year. Uh, tax levy that 159697. We're allowed to increase that levy, and again, with a goal of getting to current year uh, allowable limit, allowed to, allowed to increase that by a tax based growth factor, which is provided by the state. Every single school district across the state uh, is assigned um, a tax based growth factor based on uh, assessments uh, grown, going up in each particular district. Uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, those are generally made available uh, at some point in November, early December. Uh, ours has been consistently right around that figure if you go back. And by the way, we do provide this um, formula in our budget books every year. So you're just getting a little um, uh, sneak peek at it, I guess. And really wanted to bring this to your attention because some numbers are changing here. Uh, we add prior year pilot payments. Uh, that Those are payments in lieu of taxes for any sort of um, tax negotiations may, may have occurred with the village or economic development corporations, uh, any of that. Um, and then um, that number is de brought down by different types of exclusions. Uh, so uh, the three main ones are capital uh, and debt and lease expenditures. And then you also take away building aid. So what does that mean? It means your principal and interest payments on any existing debt. Uh, you take uh, that away, uh, and then you also take away um, building uh, your building aid. All right, it's any state aid received on any of that debt service on any given year. Uh, you're also allowed to deduct uh, lease payments, uh, and this is where we're getting a change this year. So thankfully, you know, for Lisa, and I had Lisa do this as an exercise uh, this year. Uh, we both did it separately. So Lisa, go ahead and prepare. I'll do it. Uh, myself and we'll see where we see where we get typically or in the past uh, Jeff Martin uh, typically done this uh, so uh, in going through this uh, what we discovered is um, lease payments um, we have a copier lease and we have a um, computer lease which is actually the the major number in this had historically been taken as an exclusion um, in our tax cap calculation and we've gone through and checked this, and they should not have been taken as an exclusion, uh, to put it bluntly. Um, so the debt service is correct, the building aid has been correct, uh, and uh, the building aid, or the lease payments uh, have been prop improperly, uh, as we look back at taking away uh, or using it as an exclusion. Uh, so we'll get to that in a slide or two when we see the difference. So this is right now, this is the um, tax cap levy limit with the auditorium, correct, right, with the auditorium, um, is a 2.69. So if we go down, uh, as I work my way down through the formula, you have the 152.6, uh, the tax base or the allowable levy growth due to CPI, which is the other number that can inflate it or bring it up, is 1.02 or 2%. We're capped at 2%. Uh, can't be any higher than that. It doesn't matter if we're running at 6.8% or 9%. It can go no higher than 2. We haven't been at 2. I think we may, we may have been at 2 last year, but other than that, it's typically been down lower than 1. We've been much lower than that um, in years years before that. You take away the pilots that we talked about. You do the exclusion um, uh, 
calculation that $8.6 million now is elevated because we have the auditorium in there. We have an anticipated P&I payment um, and all our up-to-date building aid numbers, and you get a tax cap of 2.69%. So we go to the, that's, that was a lot of information. <laughs> go to the next one, and this is without the auditorium. So we have the similar numbers up top, and then you can see that second, third row from the bottom, that $7.4 million. You can see that's less than where that 8-point-something number was previously. And then you can see what it does to the tax levy limit, it comes down 1.94%. Okay. Also within that $7.4 million is the offsetting debt service, uh, transfer from debt service. So that sort of brings it, uh, the number down as well because they're looking at tax impact. So the tax impact, remember, is the expense side minus the debt service transfer or the revenue side. So the net difference is the part that would be um, hitting the tax the tax levy at the end of the day which is about 1.2 million dollars in the auditorium project Correct. so with that 1.2 million dollars is not included in this slide but was included two slides ago Correct. so you can see uh, the note on this um, the major change the driver on this one um, uh, so without the high school auditorium is the leases uh, the total on that was about $1.6 million in those lease payments that had been previously included. So you can think about that's close to a percent of levy, right? So if those leases were added, um, you could sort of increase those tax levy limits by about a percent for simple math. Yep. So what's driving the budget? Um, so there are a number of a whole page full of major budget drivers. Uh, obviously, the largest one would be the on the expense side is the inclusion in this draft, particular draft of about four point nine million dollars for transfer to capital. Most of that is a high school auditorium. We also have three smaller projects uh, totaling about seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars included uh, in in that work. Um, contractual salary increases um, with all of our employees. That's net of retirements um, and any other breakages that we've accounted for. Health insurance is a major driver, almost $2 million uh, budget to budget. Other employee benefits would be um, dental insurance, workers' comp, unemployment, uh, Social Security, and the like. Special education, uh, net of salaries, uh, about three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, budget to budget, you'll see if you look at the actual expenses projected for this year, you know that gap isn't quite there because we're trying to uh, budget uh, more against actual expenditures and projected expenditures for next year. Uh, we talked about in our budget accomplishments, uh, the Wi-Fi improvements and the financial and HR software driving most of the increase uh, in the technology budget. Instructional, um, again, net of, net of salaries. Uh, we have some STI and professional development increases. Some of this is accounting. Uh, so one of the great things uh, Lisa's been doing um, is really looking at some of our, uh, the way we put in expenditures and our revenues. Uh, so in the past, we would have some sort of contra or negative numbers in our budget if we anticipate a revenue. Um, so sort of the net effect would be the same. Uh, but I think rightfully so. Um, we've been categor categorizing like STI. We get some revenues from Edgemont, who we share the program with. That really should be accounted for as a revenue, uh, as a miscellaneous revenue. So we've gone ahead and do that. But when doing that, that sort of elevates the, the expense uh, as well. Uh, and that's a perfect example of that. Uh, we talked about, um, Carol talked about some of the staffing increases. So here, the social emotional support consultants, uh, 200,000. Uh, transportation, we do have the transportation study, as we talked about in the accomplishments. Um, fuel costs uh, increasing and trying to get that number. Uh, they have been increasing. Now we're trying to get that number uh, more correct in the budget. Uh, lease facility equipment um, with the village. Uh, we have a budget from them. Athletic travel, uh, and you'll hear uh, Ray talk about that later, uh, driving uh, that number and some updated routing software costs. 
uh, plant operations and maintenance, uh, utilities uh, increasing as we've all seen in our homes. Uh, we're thankful for the warm weather uh, this winter, so that will certainly assist, but we can't plan on that going into the future. Uh, those roof and field studies that we've talked about, and I would say uh, of all the different components or areas that we look at, uh, we are seeing the impact of uh, inflation in this area um, as we look at their supply uh, lines where we're not really, um, well, we're seeing some major changes uh, when we do our, um, even with our bids, when we do our bids and we have firms like that aren't able to hold that price at all. Um, so there's been a lot of conversations. And I would say, again, that's probably one of the major areas that's impact that inflation is being uh, taking an impact on. High school library and central office furniture, $150,000. Um, uh, the high school on their list had a replacement of all the furniture uh, in their library uh, that's aging in central office for efficiency purposes and to return uh, some of our meeting room spaces um, back to meeting room spaces that are currently being used as offices. Uh, legal services, trying to get that number correct, and we do have negotiations coming up uh, next year with the teachers, and we know um, that will take some attorney time on, on that one. Uh, some decreases, uh, debt service, uh, our debt service P&I payment um, is decreasing uh, on the most recent bond project, uh, 566000 uh, That might sound like great news, but unfortunately, you, what you really have to look at on this one is uh, taxpayer uh, effort or taxpayer impact. Uh, so we get building aid back uh, as a revenue. Uh, so that net difference is sort of that taxpayer impact. So the building aid is... Uh, decreasing to a larger, slightly larger uh, extent than the and the P and I payment uh, is decreasing. So great on the budget side, but taxpayer impact um, it doesn't have that same impact. And that was part of the plan when we did the borrowing on the 2018 bond was to sort of match that. We knew that was going down. So like a debt service, you know, you're trying to make that as level as possible uh, with the variables that are known at that time. Uh, decrease uh, in the transfer to school lunch fund. We had budgeted about $75,000. Well, not about. We budgeted $75,000 current year uh, and more than that the previous year to cover anticipated losses due to COVID and numbers being down. We we're able to, now that the lunch service program is uh, breaking uh, even and making a little but, bit of money, and I anticipate that to go into the future, that we were able to take that out as a budget line, which is great. And then current year tax tertiary reserves, um, those are continued to be settled and current, cur current claims are really decreasing. Um, so we were able to decrease that by 60,000 as well. Um, and those are your major drivers. Uh, so what is this? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I was like, where are you looking? Um, so overall, uh, the overview, uh, what does this mean? So. Uh, uh, budget draft number one, and again, this is, uh, as Drew mentioned, this is uh, the budget is true to our budget development process. Everything that we spoke about in all of our meetings, all of our staffing recommendations, everything that's been vetted, um, just a little bit over $184 million. It's a budget-to-budget -budget increase of 6.2%. Tax levy, 4.55%. The levy limit, as we shared, is 2.69%. Again, this is with the auditorium in it. Uh, and about $3 million over the levy, uh, levy limit in terms of dollars. Just want to mention why the tax rate increases TBD. We don't yet. Um, it'll be forthcoming. We, again, there's a number of scenarios here, um, so we'll be plugging those in pretty soon. Yeah. And this is another slide that I do every year. I think it just sort of lays out like a little bit more on the revenue. So how are, how is that budget um, being paid for, if you will? So that top row total expenditures is the total budget. Uh, you can see the year to year get a 6.2 percent, uh, 10.7 million dollar increase. Other revenues uh, increasing from year to year of about 1.265 million or 11.38 percent. Uh, you can probably guess. A major driver on that one is interest earnings. Uh, for current year, I think we budgeted about 260000 or something like that, and well over a million dollars, uh, or just about a million dollars for next year. Also, a little bit on county sales tax, other 
revenues in that category uh, are relatively flat. Um, we did include that uh, back up um, as part of our package this evening uh, for those of you interested in the detail. And we'll talk about those in budget session number three. Uh, transfer from reserves, um, you'll see here uh, the major driver is, um, although not detailed, is the transfer from the debt service reserve um, that would be there upon uh, the transfer from by the board at some point in the future. Uh, if that were the choice, uh, that would be the driver uh, budget to budget increase of $3 million. And again, that would offset the on the budget expenditure side, the payment for the auditorium project. That assigned fund balance uh, going down 825000 as previously discussed and as we saw in the projected fund balance, uh, showing the total levy increase of 4.5%. All right, now we go into a different scenario. This is 1A. So this is everything that we previously talked about, excluding the high school auditorium. So we take it away on the budget expense side and we take it away on the budget revenue side. That decreases the overall budget to 179.3 million, resulting in about 3.5% budget to budget increase, 3.8% on the levy, and you can see now that levy limit drops to just a little bit below 2% because we're taking away that exclusion. Um, and we're still short the $2.9 million since it's almost a one for one trade off. Um, so now let's take a little step back again. So our historical and projected revenue summary. Um, and this is where we get some of the details where you see the interest or changes in the interest earnings in the county sales tax, uh, state aid decreasing from that aforementioned bud building aid that I talked about is the big driver here. We saw some increases um, in the governor's proposal for uh, foundation aid, which is encouraging. We won't know those final numbers until uh, the budget is, is passed and uh, hopefully a, uh, about six or seven weeks. Um, then we'll uh, fine tune those numbers, but you can see the increase, uh, projected increase in county sales tax, which is good. Interest earnings, uh, a $700,000 increase uh, year to year in our budget. You can see our projected uh, $1 million this year, uh, which is helping our overall fund balance. Building use fees, although only projected to be 85,000 as things still return from uh, pre-COVID, we are projecting those numbers uh, to increase uh, still again. Uh, miscellaneous, uh, some of that is to the aforementioned uh, uh, way of treating some of the revenues that we've been receiving in the past now uh, falling into the miscellaneous category. Uh, so you would see an increase there sort of offset on the expense side. So that would pretty much wash out. Uh, bisected dwellings uh, remaining uh, steady. Um, if you recall uh, from the past, these are for properties uh, where that boundary line actually splits through the house. Um, and the household actually has a choice of what school district uh, to send their students to. If they uh, are a like a White Plains taxing jurisdiction, they pay, pay taxes to White Plains, uh, but the student chooses to go to Scarsdale, uh, we're able to bill back White Plains uh, their taxes that they pay. Um, that's a, obviously a, a big driver here, uh, and Lisa is heading up that billing effort uh, in the business office. Transfers is uh, largely driv driven by the transfer from debt service. Um, and then um, you have our signed fund balance of $1.1 million uh, and a resulting uh, grand total revenues of $184.1 uh, million. Uh, now you'll note the assigned fund balance, you only see that in the budget number, right? Because that is uh, not a true revenue. We're using our own funds for that. Uh, so it's not like someone's writing us a check that we can actually count it as a revenue, um, which is why you don't see it in uh, actual revenues. And on the budget expense side, um, and again, there's lots of ways of sort of splitting up the budget. Um, I have uh, traditionally shown it um, uh, with these components, but you could also split it out by salaries and benefits and all of that as well. Uh, but a way of uh, discussing uh, sort of larger categories and impacts, um, you can see uh, the split out here. Uh, and you can see the big drivers, uh, transfers to capital, again, uh, the auditorium project, um, 
you know, is the major driver in that category, a thousand percent increase year to year, obviously, because it's a big project. Uh, regular education um, is all of our uh, instruction um, in typical K-12 classrooms outside the special education. Driver there would primarily be salaries for all of our contractual teaching staff or certified staff uh, providing instruction. Um, and actually administration is in there as well. Uh, special education uh, is that increase we saw previously um, of $1.25 million. A lot of that is contractual. We talked about trying to get that closer to projected actual. Um, you can see it's about $800,000 difference. Uh, a lot of that is driven uh, by that sort of right sizing and then also uh, the salaries which were previously extracted from that budget driver slide. Transportation would be salaries and those other budget drivers I talked about. Employee benefits, primarily health insurance. Uh, and there's the debt service uh, reduction. Uh, and hopefully those revenues and expenditures uh, match from the uh, other slide. And you'll also notice uh, the projected revenue that we saw in the previous slide and the projected actual. If you go back to that projected fund balance that they tie into uh, what we were using there to project out what our fund balance would be at the end of the year. In the ever popular pie chart, you can show uh, sort of where the money is uh, uh, going uh, in this way of looking at the particular budget. Uh, you can certainly see uh, employee benefits. Uh, if we were to have a category or a piece of pie that was called salaries, you know, that would be another 50% uh, or so um, of, the total, of the total pie as we are a people business, as you know. So we'll start talking about the transportation component as soon as I get another sip of water. Okay. So again, this is looking at each component separately. Um, we're doing some of the operational ones along with athletics tonight as Drew shared. And then we'll uh, next, uh, our budget session two, we'll talk about uh, Edgar and curriculum um, and special education and, and technology. Uh, so just a reminder, our fleet travels uh, a lot of miles every year, 650,000 miles, 63 bus drivers, 13 bus driver, bus monitors. Uh, bus monitors are provided. Uh, those are uh, providing special services as assigned by special education. Uh, so IEP, individual, individualized education plans. Um, and it amazed me, um, I can do some perspective here, or perspective since this is my last budget, which is exciting. Um, amazed me when I moved downstate, I spent the first part of my career in upstate New York. So it always amazed me the number of private schools um, and number of opportunities for all of our students. We provide a great educational program at Scarsdale, but we also have almost 300 students going to 58 private and parochial schools. Now there's laws on how far we can uh, transport um, students, it's 15 miles. Um, but it's amazing how far 15 miles can get you in lower Westchester County. Uh, so we travel down into Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan. We go out into Connecticut. We go across into Rockland County, um, and we go you know, up into Putnam County as well. So we were truly all over the tri-state area on every, any single day. Our drivers, many of them not coming back till 5 o'clock in the evening, many of them getting on the road at you know, 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, they are the first faces our students see every day and they play a very important part um, of the day for all of our students. Um, so uh, as part of our budget, uh, we are uh, proposing a vehicle replacement plan consistent in dollars uh, from the current year, uh, just short of $300,000. Um, $300,000 doesn't get you as much as it used to um, with these large vehicles. Uh, they are uh, the safest vehicles on the road. Um, and we are seeing the impact of inflation in this area uh, as well. Um, drivers in this budget, as we talked about, um, this is another one of those uh, methodologies. Uh, summer special education, many of our special education students uh, have a summer program um, and we do transport them, them all across that same area we were just talking about. Uh, we had previously accounted for that in the general fund. Um, and uh, Lisa is, is just making that bit of a change. Uh, net effect is zero, uh, but on the budget side, um, $188,000 increase. So it's a bit of a driver on that. We do have dollars in there uh, for the aforementioned transportation efficiency study. 
Um, and I, I actually don't like the efficiency study. I think we called it out as a comprehensive study because it truly is, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, also included in this budget, and it's important to talk about because we are including these purchases now, uh, one of the things that we did catch in looking at our uh, tax cap levy limit calculation is the lease with the village for the maintenance facility, uh, and then any related capital expenditures can be included, uh, which we haven't been including. Uh, unfortunately, not to the same dollar amount, or maybe fortunately, uh, but um, those dollar amounts, the lease with the village, 126305 which is the amount that's uh, least recent history has been the amount of the, the lease, uh, is included in this budget, uh, along with a $150,000, um, an increase of 70000 was 80000 this current year for related capital equipment purchases for that lease maintenance facility. And we get that as part of the uh, village's proposal for their budget every year. Um, I got a special um, budget proposal for them. Um, and so we do, and also we are billed individually for mechanics or at month, on a monthly basis for repairs as well. Those aren't excluded because they're normal operating procedures, um, uh, but they are also part of this budget. So uh, again, the transportation study uh, is included um, in the draft number one. We've talked about this for a number of years, but I think in talking about this uh, with Drew and thinking about the future and electric vehicles and getting a really good um, basis of sort of taking that next step as we look at the transportation department. Our buses are getting older. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, uh, we spend a lot of money on gas um, and you know there's a mandate that we go to electric buses. Uh, so going through a transportation study, uh, a comprehensive study, and not only looking at um, you know, the first four or five bullets, you know, our financial, our labor, hire a lot of drivers, um, our routing practices all across Tri-State, uh, our maintenance, uh, what are our policies, making sure there's consistency across the board, but also doing that fleet study um, to look at um, the aging fleet and then really getting that firm understanding to be able to take that next step in, in looking at where we go with electric vehicles. Uh, you know, and as you know, if you looked at this all, at, at this at all, you know it's just not about buying a vehicle, right? You have to have all, all that infrastructure in place as well. Um, so, you know, I see this, and again, I'm not going to be here for this, but I, I see this as a joint venture with the village. We have, you know, that village agreement. Um, I think there's lots of uh, potential there for looking at these things, um, you know, together um, because they have a lot of vehicles as well, quite frankly. I would just say this is an area of very active engagement among the, the business officials and the superintendents of both talking to each other about what we're thinking, but also engaging with professionals um, in the industry who are up to speed or trying to come up to speed on the federal dollars that are associated with um, funding electric vehicles for schools and also the uh, state dollars, which are still... Um, kind of working through the regulations and the rules for uh, the bond, right, that was passed uh, in the vote this past November. Correct. And I, and, and I know, Ron, you've done some research on what, uh, this as well. I know, you know some of the challenges that we're facing uh, for bus replacement, um, I think we're seeing right now still on an electrical vehicle. So there's a long, long waiting line um, for a normal vehicle. Um, and I'm hearing it might be worse still for the electric vehicles. It just takes a long time by the time you order it, by the time it's manufactured, by the time it's delivered, and by the time it's operational. Uh, it could be up to, I think, two years. I, I think one of the districts just received it um, when I spoke with them, and they had ordered it, I think, two years ago. Um, so it's uh, issues. I mean, a lot of the manufacturing plants are, you know, they're building pickup trucks instead. Um, it's the same, you know, same lines, and they go, you know, where the money is. Um, so it's something that's going to have to be rectified. Um, you know, right now it is a, a law, zero emission by 2027, all new purchases, and then your complete fleet by 2035. So it's a, it's a lofty aspiration. So needless to say, we view this as a, a very important budget item uh, this year. To, we have uh, kicked sure. this can down the road. Yes. Sorry for the pun in our transportation study um, yeah. past couple of years, yeah. so. And there's our pie chart about 
3% of the budget for transportation. And debt service and lease purchases. So you can see our budget to budget uh, going down about 600,000, just short of $600,000 uh, from year to year, as we talked about previously. Um, we uh, major player or major dollar amount in that obviously is that 2018 uh, bond project, which is now 99.99% uh, .99 complete. Um, and you can see our overall debt service uh, there uh, still uh, about $47 million. Yep. Uh, and you can see the bar chart. Uh, this doesn't show that uh, net taxpayer impact like I was previously talking about. This is strictly on the expense side. Uh, but the building aid or taxpayer impact number does mimic this to a certain extent where you can see that debt fall off in uh, for the 27 28 school year. And you've heard me talk about this the next opportunity, you know, for possibly filling that gap and doing another bond project. Uh, those conversations really should start next year uh, if that is the goal uh, to fill that gap with like debt service or whatever it may be. And lease purchases, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, so uh, staying consistent from year to year in this uh, proposed version or budget draft number one, made, prim made up primarily of those computer lease payments, about $1.6 million. Uh, energy performance contract, uh, $621,000. Now that will be another gap in the budget next year. I've talked about that previously. Um, those were for energy improvements made uh, 10 years ago or so. Uh, so that's another conversa conversation, uh, it's sort of, I say, loosely starting. Um, and certainly that money could be used for anything, uh, but personally I think it'd be pretty neat to think about some sustainability type projects uh, to you know, be consistent with those original purpose of those budget dollars. Uh, and then we have the uh, copier uh, lease agreement, which still would have, I believe, two more years left uh, after this current year, maybe three, I think three. And there's your just about 5% budget, 5% of the budget on those. And employee benefits. Uh, so a lot of budget drivers here, you know, almost $41 million of the budget. Budget to budget increase of $2.6 million, largely d driven by the health insurance uh, of just about $2 million. Uh, TRS and ERS contributions although those percents are going down because they're a function of overall salaries, the budget number goes up. Uh, so both of those about $281,000. Social, Social Security and Medicare, uh, about $272,000. And then those other smaller insurances, about $50,000. Again, budget, budget to budget. And TRS, ERS, you can see those going down. Uh, a little bit year to year. I don't think I updated that ERS one, so I'll have to go back and look at that one. But that's close. Employee benefits, 22%. You can see it's a bigger piece of the pie um, than some of those other areas for sure. Okay, we'll invite Ray to the table. Yeah. For interscholastic athletics. Thank you, Drew. Um, so um, if we look at the budget for next year for interscholastic athletics, um, just a few reminders. Uh, we do use a zero-based line item budget process, so we start from scratch each year, uh, looking at the needs we need for the following year, take an inventory of what we have, uh, and then plan accordingly. And we also try to use a cost basis approach to normalize costs over time. And we've done that primarily in uniforms, uh, supplies, uh, and equipment. Uh, the increase in the budget this year is primarily due to inflation around supplies, just the cost of inflatables. <laughs> Balls is about, you know, 50% of total costs um, for each ball that we buy. Um, and uniforms, uh, is twofold. The cost of uniforms because the supply chain has gone up and uh, the performance fabrics are not lasting as long as they had previously when we wore polyester. Um, some other increases are to some of the uh, equipment uh, that we... Um, that is coming due for replacement, uh, and also the repair and maintenance, which is primarily um, associated with the fitness center. That, that equipment now is being repaired more frequently, uh, and need for maintenance is higher uh, because it's no longer brand new. 
You'll also see increases in travel, which is mostly related to our postseason uh, success. Uh, it was about $35,000 um, increase this year just because our teams did so well um, over the number of days, and that's um, mostly hotel stays for the number of students we had. In this budget, there'll also be additional stipends, which will help us uh, meet our long-term goal uh, related to having at least two coaches per team. Uh, we fill those as we find qualified people. Um, we'll try to maintain that. Uh, and there's also an additional stipend per season for an assistant athletic director to, uh, to assist with supervision uh, and other responsibilities related to high school athletics. Uh, just to go over a, a little bit about the participation rates, um, over the last few years we've seen increased uh, participation rates that are about 63% um, of our student body at the high school, which is incredibly high for a school our size, incredibly high. Um, in the fall alone, we had 40% of our students uh, participating in one season uh, without replication um, or double counting students. Um, right now, we're at 53%. Uh, winter's usually our lowest. Uh, at about 28%. And if you look at um, over time, um, those percentages in the parentheses, that's our male female breakdown. Uh, and right now we're roughly about 50% um, male and female, which is great. Uh, emerging opportunities this year uh, at the modified level, we did offer a boys volleyball program, which is not yet competitive uh, because other schools haven't jumped on board yet, but we expect uh, teams to be added. Uh, when we first added the boys volleyball program at the high school, we were one of uh, five teams. The following year went to six, and now next year there will be 20 teams across the section participating in boys volleyball. Um, we also offer a winter track experience, which is not yet competitive just because it's um, not really appropriate uh, place to send uh, middle schoolers to the armory as of yet, and there aren't that many competitive opportunities otherwise, um, but they do have an experience where they can train uh, and they're um, they get some gainful experience every afternoon uh, with their peers and with trusted adults. This year, the varsity fencing team, you'll hear a little more about it later, um, but it went through its first competitive season, uh, which I think was incredibly important for those students, and we'll be conducting uh, an evaluation at the end of the season. Next slide, please. And as you see each year, interscholastic athletics, while it's a rule of thumb to be about 2% or less of the total budget here at Scarsdale, we're about 1%. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ray. Appreciate it. Okay, so that concludes the um, sort of the first go at the budget. As Stuart said at the top, um, this was our as authentic to the process that we um, engaged in as possible, showing the two variations, one including the high school auditorium renovation and then a second version uh, without. Um, as we discussed and looked at this, we realized that a uh, budget of $3 million above the tax cap, we should expect to be asked what sorts of things would we do if we had to get closer or below the, the tax cap. So we thought we would share um, a version with and without the auditorium uh, that reflects two areas of work on that question of reducing that, that $3 million gap. Coming at it, one, from the expenditure side, proposing some of the things we might consider reducing or postponing um, in terms of some of our new proposals. And then also from the application of fund balance to lower lower that gap as well. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, those two strategies with some specific descriptions. Uh, but first, we're gonna show what the result of those uh, approaches looks like. First, with the auditorium in the budget, and second, uh, without. So, Stuart, you want to do this one? Sure. Uh, so uh, again, this is what we call budget draft number two. Uh, so this has our preliminary considerations for reduction, uh, which we'll see in a, a little bit here. Uh, applied use of some reserves, and it does include um, the high school auditorium uh, project. So $183.2 million, uh, budget to budget increase of 5.7. 
uh, an increase in tax levy is now 3.21 and the projected tax levy limit, again, because it has the auditorium project, about 2.69% and the gap is uh, about $825,000 or that amount above uh, the projected tax levy limit. Same strategies in this version, except we've removed the auditorium. So budget to budget increase of 2.98%, increased tax levy of 2.46, and a similar $830,000 uh, difference between the tax levy limit and this proposed budget. So now we'll talk about how did we uh, uh, get to those possibilities. So we have a couple of pages here of uh, row by row uh, considerations for reductions. Um, I'll take a couple of these and then I'm gonna ask Jeannie to talk a little bit about the technology related ones. And then I'll come back to the one at the bottom here. So uh, we did, Stuart talked about a little bit of a increase in furniture uh, budget line as a budget driver. Uh, one idea here would be to postpone those things. We, um, we were looking to replace aging high school library furniture and to kind of complete the reorganization of special education with some furniture needs. Uh, there is furniture in both of those locations now that although we desire changing and, and updating it, it could be uh, delayed a year and that totals together about $150,000. I'll ask Jeannie to talk about the two technology pieces. Thank you. So the two pieces we're looking at first is the computer lease. Uh, we spend roughly $1.6 million per year on new hardware across K through 12, and that also includes district level hardware. Um, one proposal is to reduce uh, a one year by $600,000. Now we pay that over a four year lease, so it would actually only be $150,000 per year reduction. Um, how we could achieve that is by delaying uh, the replacement of classroom desktops in the elementary schools. Um, and we would extend their lifespan by, for example, upgrading from a, a traditional hard drive to a solid state drive. So there really wouldn't be a felt impact uh, on the classroom. Uh, we would push it back a year. Um, and we did get questions before. This would not include like our specialized labs. We would reserve money to replace like the e-music lab in the middle school. And we would also keep reserves um, we'd be able to replace the art lab um, in the high school. Uh, the second one is software. We had a, a large jump as expected in our educational software budget during COVID. Um, Pre-COVID numbers were about $215,000 a year. After COVID, we jumped about 327 per year. Um, so it's a 50% increase. And so, you know, there are some duplicate pieces there, but there are some, you know, software we just could review and say we don't need anymore. For example, our Zoom license for 3,000 web person webinar, we haven't used for a year. So we can discontinue that for a $10,000 savings. So there's, there's areas we can look at to say, we're not getting rid of the software, but we can reduce the number of licenses to meet the actual need. Excellent, thank you, Jeannie. And the bottom item here, um, we have at Stuart and I and Eric, along with our facilities team and one of our high school students have been um, learning about and um, engaging with a, an organization called Synergistics, uh, which is a, they have a model and technology that um, they work with institutions, school districts, higher education institutions to try to identify significant opportunities for energy reductions and associated with energy reductions or cost reductions. And um, we would like to, so we have a proposal here that would, um, I'd say conservatively, allow us to uh, reduce that part of our budget by a quarter of a million dollars next year. We would like to have them come present to the board as they've presented to us to explain the program, uh, understanding that it's a, um, multi-year commitment with them, that their model depends on having five years of work together in order to achieve savings. Savings in that amount or greater would be guaranteed over the five-year period, um, you know, and we do pay a cost. So this is the net uh, savings associated with that, that program. So they are available to come speak with the board uh, on March 6th and um, 
as long as you're open to that, we would we would want to do that. So instead of taking a lot of time here, just understand that's an, an item to come that we see as um, obviously beneficial to the bottom line and to the district, but it also uh, has components that are educational and they have a data system that makes the savings and how those savings are being achieved visible to the community, to our students and, and to the community members, faculty, staff, and so on. Um, so we're kind of excited about that and we'll bring that to you next time. Continuing, um, continuing with the, re the reductions, um, you know, we have proposed adding the custodian. I think you'll recall um, that that uh, is both a response to a felt need from us, especially associated with weekend use and the comptroller's audit uh, pointed out opportunities for savings in overtime through that. Uh, but that is something that uh, we very much would like to have, don't necessarily have to have, and we would, um, obviously see some savings by not, uh, by delaying having that in our budget for next year. Um, we also did some, you know, close, with Lisa's help, some really close look at the special education budget, um, looked at our, our uh, provision of food. We do provide food at meal times, working uh, meal times as part of our board policy, but maybe shaving around the edges there, limiting drinks, desserts, stuff like that as part of that for $25,000. Um, we had, I had <laughs> asked Stuart to get costs on software that helps us do long-term financial planning, multi-year financial planning. Um, you know, we know Stuart's successor will be coming on board in, in the summertime, uh, knowing we have a big software uh, implementation for the budgetary accounting and human resources software that we've talked about, that maybe that's something we could wait a year on uh, till that major project were accomplished and then consider bringing that on. And then uh, the high school did ask for additional money in student activities. Again, we're doing what we're doing now. That would be additional. Those are the types of things that we, that we looked at uh, to, to show you how we would think about reducing expenditures as part of that gap closing effort. Uh, and that those things on those two pages we just showed you total eight hundred and sixty six thousand seven hundred and ten dollars and I will turn over to Stuart on the reserves um, sure uh, so we have three areas uh, of potential use of reserves uh, both the ERS and TRS as I showed uh, in those uh, expenditure budget lines were increasing uh, so the idea here would be to use those reserves to basically flatten the budget so there'd be a zero percent increase or zero dollar increase uh, you can see those amounts there uh, and then taking a million dollars from the health insurance reserve uh, to bring that budget to budget um, back to a sort of a historical norm as far as an increase goes uh, so you know we realize uh, that you know continually relying on a reserve can be um, potentially precarious, right? Um, so uh, looking at uh, current year claims, projecting out next year claims, uh, and then with the hope of those things becoming more normalized, uh, that the use of the reserves uh, going forth in the 24-25 budget would not be necessary. Right, uh, and then taking all of those uh, reductions and revenue additions into account, uh, you can see uh, the resulting uh, budget increase. Again, this is with the auditorium uh, in place would be a 5.71 percent budget increase, and a 3. Point, <coughs> excuse me, a 3.21 um, percent uh, tax levy increase. So, all in, we've shown you four different. Um, high-level versions of potential budgets. So just to recap, the first we showed you was our, as we are describing it, sort of our authentic come forward with the budget, the proposed staffing increases with the auditorium. The second version we showed you uh, removed the auditorium from the budget, uh, and we would discuss that as a separate project through separate means. Then what we've just shown you are uh, a version of the budget that has two mechanisms to close the 
nearly $3 million gap, with or without the auditorium, uh, between the allowable tax levy limit and the, and the budget as proposed. So these bring uh, 800 plus thousand dollars in reductions plus the thoughtful application of reserves to, to close that gap. So what we just showed you was the 5.71% budget to budget and 3.21% tax levy increase. That's with the auditorium. The fourth column over um, sort of uh, outlined in orange is uh, without the auditorium. So that would be a, a 2.98% budget to budget and a 2.46% tax levy. Uh, again, still above the cap by about $830,000. Budget timeline, finishing up. Uh, as we showed you at the onset, this is st budget study session number one. We uh, will be back here March 6th and March 20th to complete our three budget study sessions, uh, budget forum and, and review on March 17th, and then uh, shooting for, a, for an adoption of, of a proposed budget by April 17th. And we um, have talked for a long time and turn it over to you for questions, hopefully answers and feedback. Well, I'll just start by saying thank you for um, providing us with those multiple scenarios and, and I think that really gives us a lot of information that we were looking for. Um, so I appreciate the effort that Stuart, Lisa, you went to Drew. So I'll turn it over to board members for questions. Bob. Um, yeah, thanks. This is a lot of detail, a lot of information, and I, and I really do frankly appreciate the scenario. I always kind of wondered why we didn't do it that way, so I was pleasantly surprised. Um, maybe I missed it and maybe I didn't, but it seems to me one potential reduction that I, that I don't see having been explored, and again, I apologize if it has been, but it's not presented, is reducing the budget of the auditorium. In other words, if we were to go to the architects and say, can we uh, essentially keep our scope and remove $500,000, the question in my mind is could we? And maybe you've asked that question, but you know, particularly now that I see a, a, this gap of eight hundred thirty-two thousand um, dollars, you know, I guess you know, I will, I won't, I won't be shy to comment that I thought, as you know, the budget was was generous and high. Um, I'm not saying it's not fair, but I do think it's generous and high. So I'm just wondering whether they have been put through the exercise of value engineering, if at all possible, so that we could in fact pr um, include the auditorium, but perhaps uh, less um, with, with a modification of something that could be done. And I, I don't, I'm not gonna be wise enough to say I know what that is, but. Yeah, I'm not, so. Let me just start, if we look at the fourth example, right, the f column all the way to the right on this slide, mm -hmm. that does Go not include the auditorium. Right. So there's, there's not like a one-to-one -one there for that $500,000 yeah, right, right, to, yeah. yeah. So just, right. just wanted to. I, 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 yeah, I looked it, at the wrong column. It's because of the, yeah. the formula for the task cap because it's exclu an excluded item. So right, but, you, but, could, but, you could still cut three, you know, not do a project and you still have that same gap, basically. Yeah. So I, I would argue the, converse, the, the question is a legitimate one. Yeah. It's not necessarily the route to closing the okay. gap between okay. the allowable tax levy and the okay. proposed budget. So, and I think the, okay. I think the, the most, like the simplest answer to the question in talking to the architects is, yeah, that, that would come th you know, through value engineering and materials, choosing um, potentially lower cost materials. Correct. Yeah, I think if we went back to them um, and we, you know, the the marching orders, if you will, where it's like we want a three and a half million dollar right. auditorium, taking into account everything that we shared with you, mm -hmm. with what we want, you know, how how do we get there? Right. So so that that is exactly what you know. We're on the same page here. I just 
again, I think for, for clarification, this is very helpful with and without, but it seems to me they're moving forward because one doesn't necessarily have to choose any of these. It could be a, a variation on, you know, or, or a blended hybrid, whether we could have an auditorium but with a, with a lower budget. Now, uh, to your point, maybe I'm just not putting this all together. You're basically saying even if we were to lower it, say, $800,000, it doesn't affect any of these numbers. Correct. Well, no, I mean, I have st I'm no, having a so little trouble getting. It I'm would not, absolutely affect understanding the top line. that. Yeah. It would affect the top line mm -hmm. clearly. So the if, if we look at um, draft one with auditorium, 184000 Correct. 50, that would lower dollar for dollar. Yeah. That would lower uh, uh, anything less than the $4.7 million Correct. proposed auditorium. Okay. The part that's more complicated is the the tax levy limit calculation. So the number we show um, in the very last row of this table okay. is, is the amount that that proposed budget is above the limit. The part that's not there is as calculated using the following assumptions. Okay. So in the first column, draft one with auditorium, the assumptions are certain exclusions associated with that were that are allowed associated with capital projects I see. those that would have to be recalculated with a lower budget number mm -hmm. um, okay. and it's I also want to say it's true that what we've presented are scenarios and it's not just possible that there are other scenarios I'm willing to bet the adopted budget won't be any of these right. it'll be something right. you know some variation Cheaper. Hey, my microphone's on. Come on, I'll, I'll do the best I can here. Um, it's not a dollar for dollar impact, right? And so, in other words, a, a dollar less spent on the top line isn't going to equal, you know, um, a dollar more uh, or a dollar less above the tax the gap. limit. It's not going to. It's not a dollar for dollar impact on the gap. Do we know what it, if, if, it's, if it's a dollar for twenty five cent impact on the gap, or it's just not too, too difficult to tell? I don't like doing that complicated math right at the board table, to be honest. Well, I mean, I but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course it can be. And, uh, you know, and for every dollar you do reduce it, even though the gap might not change 100% by that, I mean, the levy does. Yeah. The levy goes down. I just would think, you know, um, I'm all for, uh, you know, being economical on the cost of the auditorium, but um, I think we need to be judicious in the sense that. You know, if we you know take a, a hatchet to the auditorium budget, it's not going to take you know a corresponding hatchet to the amount over <laughs> the tax gap that we are uh, for reasons having to do with the way it's calculated. Um, and so, it would seem like you know you wouldn't want to overcut, thinking you're going to you know reap big rewards to lower the gap when in fact you won't. That's that's the only point I guess I'm making. I mean, I, I, I thank you. I I would can I respond to that? I would just say that. I would really appreciate if we were able to view these things as separate. And what I mean by that is that the auditorium, the proposed auditorium project on its merits is what it is as proposed. And of course the cost can be reduced with decisions, just, just trade-offs, you know, some less outcome or cheaper material or whatever. I, like I would caution against using that as a strategy for the the budget discussion. I think that's an area where it just gets so complicated and and we're really like that's just my view. But but how excuse me, but how I'm looking at considerations for reductions to draft budget plan number 1. Some of those things are fairly modest, you know, reductions of things. Uh, you know, facilities at, at the person, um, supplies. They're, they're, how is that different than 
the issue of the auditorium. Maybe I, I maybe my could I could I ask just one question? Going back to a bigger picture, at the start of this, we talked about auditorium and other projects of four point nine seven million, of which I think seven hundred twenty were other capital projects. So are those excluded from these? Those are all. They are. Excluded. Yeah. Could I just find out what those are? Could we talk a little bit about what? Sure. Those yeah. Are? Um, there's three of them. Uh, so one is uh, an item that came up as part of the auditorium uh, discussions. Uh, that is the roof uh, over the high school orchestra room or band room. Um, that's uh, circa 1970. Um, it leaks um, into the band room, um, and it really needs to be replaced. Um, so that's, that was like number one, like on the list of um, those projects. Uh, the other one is uh, replacement um, of the uh, chimney or the main chimney at Heathcote Elementary School, which is failing. Uh, so that's uh, you know potentially safety issue um, that needs to get addressed. Uh, and the third one is the continued replacement of some vacuum condensate pumps at the middle school, which are failing. Um, so not a you know, not a lot of items, but three ones that have been specific, specifically targeted as must-dos. Okay. And so if we went with the budgets without the auditorium, those projects would could potentially be left out as well. That, but in under your calculations, they're not included. Correct. We just pulled the auditorium. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you also mentioned a roof replacement study that you were including. Is that um, something you think that it's important to do now because of the bond timeline, or is that why? That it's was there? that was the idea. Yeah. Okay. So our uh, we did an original bond study um, when I first got here. So that must have been fall of 2015, um, 16, in anticipation of uh, the 2018 bond of work to be included for that. Um, so that's getting a bit aged at this point. So we wanted to uh, freshen that up and have the, you know the thorough review. Uh, as information to think about for the next bond. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry, that was my question on sort of the auditorium related stuff. I don't know if there's anything else or if there's other questions. I do have other questions on different topics, but if we're done, I have, oh. Um, in the case that um, the auditorium is not in this budget, let's just say, um, obviously the work has to get done at some point. Do, would you? imagine it being put in the, the, the bond in a couple years, a separate bond, work, like how would you imagine eventually the auditorium being addressed? If it I think there's all sorts of options. Um, so, I mean, clearly it's a, you know, it's a large capital project. It's, it would be larger than what we've typically done, at least in my history here within the budget. Um, so if you separate it out from the budget, um, you could do a separate standalone bond referendum. So a couple options for that. You could put it as a different uh, referendum at the time of the budget, right? You get one proposition as the budget, the second proposition totally separate. It would be the auditorium. You could do a separate stand. Uh, and efficiency with that for that would be is all your voting costs, right? You have all your voters, you have all your machines, you have all your, all your workers sort of one one stop shop uh, you could do as a separate standalone at some point in the future uh, a typical time to do those types of things would be like early fall like late fall like October early November which would probably still give you enough time if it were approved um, to get it done on a similar timeline I would want to double check that or you'd say, you know what, let's just put a pause on it. Let's make it part of, you know, you could do it at any point, but, or make it part of that next, you know, the bond project vote at some point in the future. Those are all options, but really anything is sort of on the table um, as far as choices. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, did you have another? Or, okay. So thank you so much for all of the work that went into this, whether it was the auditorium planning meetings or any of the other components, but I'll just limit my questions to the auditorium for now. Um, you know, my gut reaction was very much along the lines of what Bob uh, raised in terms of kind of a medium-sized version of the auditorium project, whether there's a way to get something that will capture the things that I think that the students and faculty have and staff have identified as priorities like 
the dressing rooms, the kind of dilapidated ceilings, uh, and some of the really immediate things that have an impact upon student life and maybe waiting on some of the acoustic um, elements. I guess my concern about bonding it separately is that this is something that the community has already voted on a bond for. And I guess I'm wondering whether you see, and maybe you've already addressed this in your answer to Susie's question, but whether you see a way of funding this if it is not included in this year's budget without going out to another bond on something that the community has already voted on a bond for. Yeah, I mean, the funding mechanism, mechanism could be, um, you know, at the board's choosing, but it certainly could be as we propose here. Uh, so if it were a separate proposition, um, either at the budget vote or, you know, in the fall um, as a separate item, uh, the wording and, of course, you know, the bond attorney would write this all up. But basically it would be um, a funding source from uh, funds already with the Board of Education of the $3.2 million uh, or thereabouts as a debt service. Uh, transfer and then the remaining amount would have to come from uh, some other source, which would be you know a small bond of the difference or whatever the choosing would be. I mean, you can split it half and half or whatever it may be. Um, and then the you know the term of the bond could be you know whatever you know the board of education could decide. Um, you know, and I would say you know some of the you know you may hear from some community members that would say the high school auditorium it's going to last 30 years or 20 years so therefore it should be you know bonded and paid for over 20 years by you know residents in the community that are going to be using it over the next 20 years instead of like you know one particular year of taxpayers so that would be a potential argument you could hear about including it in the budget um, i don't want to ask you to do math on the fly at the board table because uh, I wouldn't want to be asked to do that either. But um, is it correct to look at that, at the first two columns, the bottom row, and say, okay, if we include the, uh, the auditorium in the draft one version, we will be over right by that $2.98 million. And if we exclude the auditorium we will still be over by about 2.98 million is that a correct. correct reading okay great because that gets back to that question of how much does it lower right dollar per dollar the overage thank you so do we have other questions on the budget i know i have a couple but i'll let my board members go ahead if you have other questions go ahead oh. I have a very small one. Um, I, I really do appreciate all the work that went into this budget and thinking about creative things like that um, synergistics um, item. And I, I think it's great that we would have them present on March 6th. I think there are also some other companies that have a similar offering. Would that be like a competitive bid process where we would consider multiple folks? It's a great question. We have uh, our attorney looking at, they claim to be sole source, and they claim make that claim based on their technology. Um, the technology that they have is, is the only in this particular industry, and we have our attorney looking at it, um, but that would preclude us from uh, being able to get the same service somewhere else. I don't think it would be a competitive bid. I think it would be a request for proposals because it would be professional service. Thank you for that clarification. And then my only other question was whether you see specific costs associated with not or with delaying the implementation of the Forecast 5 software um, because I know that there's been a desire to implement it not just for the sake of changing software so much as you know, using it as a mechanism for reducing errors and two different packages. Two different so the packages. Uh, so okay, the, great. Um, the software uh, that I don't think we're willing to remove <laughs> from the budget proposal is the base accounting and human resources software. Uh, so our current system is called Smarts. You might recall we're the only district that uses it. 
in New York that's State. Not what Forecast that's Five not. is replacing. Forecast Five is a um, analytics tool that you feed with data from your uh, budgetary accounting system. Um, so I, I think the more we've thought about it, the the better idea it is to not include Forecast Five in the budget anyway because of the major project of making the transition to a new package. And then, just and then, has to happen first. And then Forecast 5 actually being able to work with yeah. the current package. Yeah. And then my last two, two very small questions. Um, Ray mentioned the um, moving most teams to sort of the better standard of having two coaches. How many additional stipends would that be? How many teams currently are single coached? Do we know? I'm, and I'm sorry for not asking that in no, advance. No, no. I just, it just occurred to me as you were speaking tonight. So, um, and my final, final question is, look, I, I really appreciate all of the effort that has gone into considering the um, coming regulations from New York State in terms of clean vehicles. And I wonder whether we've considered um, the overall cost of getting the whole fleet converted by 2035 at this point, or whether it's still something we're kind of phasing in year by year? Yeah, so the big picture around this is essentially the current costs of EVs are twice the costs, uh, cost of non-electric. Plus, plus right. the maintenance costs and other things we've discussed at but the board. There's all this money in the pipeline through grants and, and the state level bond that we as yet aren't clear on if and how much access we might get to to, to offset that. But these are questions we're gonna, we would discuss with the vendor for transportation study, taking advantage of the fact that they do this work with lots of districts and you know, what are we learning? What are we finding out um, as, as some districts may be a little ahead of us on that process? Thank you. I'm new, no one knows. Uh, uh, okay, just a few things. Uh, thank you. I know you've been thanked enough, but um, thank you. Uh, a few questions. So the Synergetics program, you mentioned it would take five years to save up. And did I mishear that? It would. It, I thought it would take up to five years to see the savings of the 250, or no, we can immediately Every add that. Year. Okay. Yeah, so it would be over a million over the five years. Got it they require a five-year engagement to, to even sign on the dotted line. Got it. Okay. Um, and then with regards to um, cutting the weekend custodian to save, I think you said 65,000. Um, if I remember correctly, one of the reasons we wanted to add that in was to offset some of the overtime costs that we were paying our current custodians. Um, so do you anticipate us kind of being in the red over time because of all the That's overtime a good we have to pay. I mean, honestly, it's going to be something that will have to continue to be reviewed. We did, you know, do all the net calculations. We did adjust our overtime in the budget, anyways, um, upward a bit, um, knowing that we were spending more uh, anyway. So, I mean, I would fully expect to see that request come yeah. back uh, this time next year if it doesn't make it through this budget process. Um, you know, something similar was uh, on the request sheet for last year. Um, so I don't think the need's going to go away. I don't think our buildings are being used, uh, you know, any less. Um, so uh, it's just something we'll have to continue to monitor. Um, the other thing that came up, I think, with regards to overtime, we had a report a few, maybe like a few months ago, about like inefficiencies with overtime. So do you see any? Um, cost savings now that we're addressing those issues that maybe could be added into this or uh, I, I know we're we're saving a lot here in the last couple of months because there's no snow to plow and shovel <laughs> uh, so that's been you can thank the board for that uh, yes <laughs> excellent excellent job with that um, so I mean some of the um, suggestions you know we're putting into place um, I mean some of them were like no-brainers like yes we need to be doing that um, you know, overall, um, I think there's still 
you know, properly budgeted and everything, but there's still overtime. Um, you know, we have high demand schools. Uh, we have high demands on our time and what work needs to get done. And, you know, we see overtime, you know, on a, every payroll um, for things that maybe I didn't even see in the past. Um, so I think they're le legit, you know, there's money in the budget for it, but they're legitimate. And I think, you know, as HR, I think Carol's done a great job of, like, you know, looking at that with fresh eyes. And Drew now certainly has that experience as well. That as you go into future budgets, to sort of thoughtfully think about how we how we staff and um, you know some of the efficiencies that are developed, um, just by thinking about things some different, in a, perhaps a different way. Right. And my last question: It's kind of the auditorium, kind of not only because um, in researching all the auditorium projects in the area. You know, one of the ones we kind of referred to often was Bronxville. It just seemed a comparative example to what we were trying to do. Um, and Bronxville, I know, allowed a level of fundraising to help offset costs. So I don't know where we are with that type, but like I think they had donors and PTA contributions and Muse Friends of Music contributions. And um, so I think if it turns out that we struggle to fund the auditorium. I don't know where the district would be in considering that type of support in, in funding it, but I know half of the Bronxville auditorium was funded purely through fundraising. So just a thought. And we know, as I see Meg Simon in the audience, we know we've had um, a great partner uh, both from the Education Foundation and from Friends of Music and the Arts and and have had those those contributions before. Um, I, this is definitely, I don't think this is on their radar as an expected project. I, that's just my, my observation. Um, I have a question slash statement. I just want to make sure my understanding is correct. So if we look at the slide that's up now and the tax levy limits, if we were to adjust them for the adjustment we had to make because of the leases to sort of get to like, well, actually, let me start, let me take this question back. That's a one-time adjustment, correct? We won't get correct. hit with that again. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Because the incremental increase will always be the incremental increase. Okay. So we're in this one-year period where, we, where we're accounting for it correctly, which is great, uh, but we're getting hit with this um, in a tough year. Just for us to think about tax cap, is it fair to say a no, kind of a normal tax cap for us this year should have been all those numbers plus one percent back if we hadn't taken that hit? All the numbers we're looking at on this sheet. Yeah, so the two six nine and the one nine four. They would have been increased by essentially you know one percent, give or take a little bit. Okay, I, I know that doesn't help us get under the cap, right. but for me personally, I sort of mentally am trying to keep that in mind because. Um, you know, the tax have, is supposed to adjust by what's going on in the world. It is at 2% because of inflation. There is a tax growth factor. My, I believe that's because there's more houses and so they assume more students are here. Um, so it doesn't help us get into the levy, but it just mentally for me, I just want to say that sort of that's, I think about that number even though it's not on, um, on the sheet. Um, in terms of... Um, and then let me just ask one other broader question before I ask some more specifics. In terms of timeline, what is the timeline that you feel you need to directions or guidance from the board around different scenarios, around being over the cap, under the cap? Uh, just I say that knowing that at our next budget study session, we're going to talk about a lot more areas that we have yet to talk about. Um, just, I don't know who that question is for. I mean, I, I think I, I don't think we should hold ourselves to this if if it becomes apparent that this is unrealistic but i think by the end of next budget study session we really need um you know we need to know where we're going um i, I would i would think so if um you know depending on where we are um you know there might be i think we do a great job of communication i think if the budget was going to be more in line with what we see here, there would have to be even more of that, you know, the reasons why and you know, why we're at this point. Okay. Um, so along those lines, given the auditorium does have a major impact, what would it take to get a, 
ballpark estimates of what additional costs we would incur if we were to bond it. I might even have that in my files back in my office. Because <laughs> um, for me, that would be interesting to know. Obviously, there's other costs. Um, to the extent, I don't know if this is feasible to know because, you, Stuart, you mentioned like we could bond the whole 4.7. We could bond for a portion of it. I don't know t whether we lose efficiencies if in school municipal bond world we only bond 1 million or 2 million versus 5. Um, so just the I think that would be helpful to know. Sure. Um, and then I had a question about the contingency positions. So we have three contingencies at 110,000. Two of them have something attached to them as a possibility, and one is a TBD. If we took a contingency like the TBD out, I'm not saying we should, but if we did, and then next year comes and we need it because elementary classrooms break and we need another teacher, is there a mechanism to fund those positions? Well, uh, not directly, <laughs> but it. this is a budget plan. I'm going to channel my inner steward. <laughs> <laughs> this is a budget plan. It's our best guess at what, what happens. There are costs that never get realized sometimes, and there are cost overages, and we look for it within that, that difference. Right, and, and I think, you know, you're, um, like this year, uh, so some things have not gone our way, and you can see that in some of our projected expenditures, most notably health insurance, right, that really did not go our way this year, and we're hoping – that normalizes or does even better. Um, uh, inflation has not helped. Hopefully our budget sort of gets that back right on the right track and things stabilize uh, as far as inflation. I think we're hopefully seeing that a little bit. I think the numbers come out tomorrow again, right? Uh, so we'll see where that goes. Um, and uh, you keep your fingers crossed a little bit, right? So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's another one of those, well, we hope we're good. Um, but you can't always control it either. Um, I, I do I do think, going back to what I said before about thinking about how we do things and having, you know, Drew at the helm, um, you know, leading those conversations and having those discussions with principals and all of that, that, that definitely helps. Um, and I think even thinking about the 24-25 budget as well, uh, there will be some opportunities there to... Um, with the budget for some flexibility um, as well, the way you think about things. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up? Um, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question on the contingencies. So how many contingency positions do we have in the budget this year? I think we had two. We've used them all, <laughs> whatever. We did we use them used all. them all. <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah, so we had two. And then had to use pieces of each, you know, to uh, to fill in for partial positions for music, art, things like that. And was that because our enrollment was higher than we expected? Yes. yes. Okay. Elementary. Yeah. It was elementary. Right. So, so okay. one for an elementary position. Uh, Fox Meadow had an additional section. Um, and then the second contingency we used for, as I said, we kind of divvied that up with uh, part-time staff due to enrollment. And so two of the contingencies that we have listed right now are high school and middle school, and are they special education? And yeah. so that's because we're predicting growth in those areas, or why are they targeted yeah. in those? Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. So we know we have, um, we've had program growth. And we're trying to anticipate the transition of kids from fifth to sixth and eighth to ninth. Okay. And um, that's really, that's, you know, we, kids, um, we don't fit kids into our programs. We design our programs to fit the kids. So we, you know, we're, kids are growing and changing and, and developing, and we do the best to anticipate the setting that they're going to need on the continuum of services. In some cases, we're not sure whether we need a setting that doesn't exist as it currently is configured, which may require more staffing, or no. The kids, it turns out, annual review happens. We do have that setting, and we can add another student to that setting instead of creating a new setting that requires a new teacher. It's a little oversimplified, but that's basically what we're talking about. I think what we did a little bit differently this year 
We normally articulate contingency positions. In fact, in the budget book, we put them all in elementary. That's just been the practice for years and years and years, even though we've occasionally used them for section expansion at the high school or, or uh, ENL in the middle school, which we did. Um, so we've tried to be a little more forward thinking about explaining where it might be. Um, and that's why our best guess was the, the special education. That's actually really helpful. And that was sort of related to my other question then, which is, so if we call the contingency position like special education high school, and it turns out we don't need that position, but we need it somewhere else. But you're you're calling it that for at this point so that we understand why. Yeah, we're, we're trying we're to get as much three. information about our thinking as possible because we know we're, we're going to be coming back to you in September to say this is what actually happened. Okay, thank you. Juan, sorry, go back to your questions. Thank you for the follow-up. Um, um, the buses, understanding the tension between the fact that we need to be all electric in 10 years or 12 years, um, can we defer these three buses? Do we need to buy them this year? Um, we do serve a double-edged sword for this. So guess guess what is also excluded in the tax gap calculation? Transportation aid? <laughs> Buses and the offsetting <laughs> transportation aid. So the gap remains the gap. Um, and I would love to say we, you know, even just dropping the budget down because it doesn't make sense to buy buses right now. Our buses, we do need to continue to replace them. Um, you know, we do have an older fleet. Um, we're spending more on repairs. And um, because they're taking a long time to get delivered. We need to get in line when we can get in line. Um, so, yeah, there would be a potential risk in that. Okay. Um, and then I, I feel, I feel like one thing I, I, I want to just point out. I don't know that it impacts my decision about the auditorium, but when we, when we look at number two and two A, um, where we, we made all these reductions that the administration proposed. And then you look at it versus 2A and you say, it doesn't seem like there's that big of a difference between whether the auditorium's in or out in terms of certain things like um, the, the increase in the tax levy, not the budget. I think one part that we're now representing here is our fund balance because th that draft two does, I believe, use two, uh, one point something, one to two million dollars of fund balance. We'd also be using three million for the auditorium and we've dropped fund balance this year. Uh, and I just, I think it's more we are cognizant of that, given our discussions last year when we had to drop fund balance, which we got back. Um, but I just think it's worth being cognizant of where our fund balance, because if health insurance is a trend, not a blip, you know, we just want to be careful about that direction we're heading. So anyway, I, I, I just want to put that out. There. Let me add to that, too. Um, and I think it's um, important for the board to understand, too. Uh, so what we have typically done since I've been here is when we've had money left over from a bond project uh, or a capital project, you know, we've brought it back in to fund another one-time um, expense, typically, you know, a, a plant improvement project or transfer to capital project. There's no mandate to do that. So you can use the funds for that or you can bring the funds back into the debt service reserve and you can use it to offset principal and interest payments on existing debt so that's another use of fund balance and you can also use that as sort of a mechanism of back funding another reserve right because if you're not spending money there you could spend money somewhere else so there are options so if the board um, decided, for instance, to we want to do the auditorium project. Maybe we don't want it to do it as part of this um, budget. Maybe we want, we want to do it as a, a bond project referendum in early October, um, and we want to bond the full thing, um, and we actually want to take that debt service reserve money and use it for a different purpose, um, reducing the budget. Now, it's still a tax cap thing, uh, but taking into account the whole fund balance plan for the future, you know, that is an option to think about that. And then my only other comment, not a question, is just, um, you know, 
This is the first year I think all districts are facing the tax cap in an inflationary environment. Um, this is something I think many districts are going to face. One of the benefits of we're part of a lot of organizations, one is Westchester Putnam School Board Association. They do put together a very useful file of all districts and where their budgets are at, where their tax cap is at. Um, I don't know, maybe we can ask them to do it a little earlier this year, given that every district is facing this. But, um, you know, I'd be very interested to, to see how other districts are managing this environment. This is, I believe, pretty uncharted territories for districts under the tax cap. Um, it, it probably will be more dependent on each individual district um, because we're, at least the CPI is at 2%, so you're getting that, you know, 102% of current, all other things being equal. And if they have a decent tax-based growth factor, now some are completely flat, but some are up in our range. And if you just look at that one for one, you're at a 3%. Uh, TRS, TRS was rather favorable this year, so that's not a horrible thing. I think one of our risk factors, which we've always talked about, is health insurance, right? And that's driving, if you took $2 million away uh, from our growth in the budget, you know, that's over 1% right there that other districts might not have. I'm not sure what the other, I believe Put Putnam, Northern, Westchester, uh, they're self-funded, but they're self-funded as a BOCI, so there's you know more um, more lives covered, more levers, to pull. more levers to pull. I believe they're single digits um, this year. Uh, I think they're in the six or seven percent range. Uh, so they, you know, they wouldn't be seeing those increases uh, like we would in this particular year. Now, we've also had years where we've been flat, and it's been, you know, as the business official and superintendent and uh you know that's great right because it's a lot that's allowed us to add some staff over the years and put money in the programs um that we wanted to and uh, that came forth um and this unfortunately that this is not one of those years that's helpful context appreciate that um historically uh being self-funded in terms of our health insurance has saved us a lot of money as a district. Um, do you still feel, you know, like that's the right way to go, given that it's cost us more recently, or it's hard to say? Or I, mean, I think you know, it's hard for Stuart sitting here <laughs> to say that. I think the, the numbers that we provided in the budget book, uh, you know, speak for themselves. You know, maybe you know at some point soon, maybe that's another study to take a look at uh, as that environment changes. And of course, the, you know, I'll say it in the positive, the best, if there's going to be a change, the best time to make that change is, yes. you know, in a very low growth moment, not a, you know, our claims are very high and because right. the premiums you'd end up going to, the premium structures. There's you know, we, we, um, we don't have any health insurance buyout in any of our union contracts, unlike a lot of our, you know, neighboring districts because they're on, Self, they're on um, insurance products, and because you, so you pay the premium, no matter what it is. So we do benefit from good years experience when people are healthy, right? Yeah. And uh, you know when you look to, as Drew said, the time to look is when all things are going great. It's probably when you don't want to look. Um, but you know the buy-ins into existing plans, uh, the costs are very very steep. Um, having seen that in different districts um, over the years. Yeah. Um, I have one more question. Um, in terms of the Wi-Fi for the fields, I know that's something that, some, that Maroon and White has talked about as being important, but as we potentially gain ground in terms of telecommunication service, do, is there a reason why we're we're thinking we need that much Wi-Fi? I'm not even sure what the cost is, but you let, Pat, you can take that, Jerry. So I think it really depends on the timing. Um, it's hard to anticipate how quickly that turnaround will happen with the installation with the carriers. Uh, but at this point, we don't have Wi-Fi along the third baseline um, of the baseball field and the far bleachers on the far side of the football field or the parking lot. Um, in those areas, we really think of as a, a, a safety issue. So it would really be a question of, would be we willing to delay that for another year? You know, how quickly will we know what the timeline is for the installation from the carriers? I think this would be able to, if we know that before the budget's passed, we'll have a solid answer. If we don't, it would be essentially us kind of 
taking a gamble on being without those safety issues for another year. Okay, thank you. All right, I think that was a lot of questions and great answers, so we appreciate all of your time this evening. Um, we look forward to budget study session two. Drew, do we want to have some direction to come back with for the next meeting? Yeah, I, you know, I, I shared the, those three pieces up front um, in terms of the um, auditorium or not, in terms of the uh, pallet to go above the tax cap or not, and then uh, as Ron just brought up, the third one was the um, thoughtful use of reserves and how we strategically use those or not. Um, so I think we would appreciate knowing sort of where the board is um, on those three on those three topics. And you know, I guess what we'd have to live with them. We're not <laughs> we're not ready to to share that if that's really you know where everybody is. Um, so you'd like that for next time, well, or you want I, that right no, just now? So we heard questions, but what we haven't really heard are where, you know, Ron shared a little bit of his, through his line of questioning about, where, I think, where he was with the tax cap and the unusual circumstances of our calculation this year. I don't mean to speak, speak for him, but, um, you know, just wondering where people are in terms of those things. If you'd be willing to share. Jim looks like he's ready to go, so. <laughs> Microphone. Listen to everything you said. You paid attention to the uh, to you know, the numbers as they were presented, and um, you know I think that uh, from my view, um, putting aside whether uh, there can be cost savings to the um, auditorium project, which I do think is a separate thing, uh, I do think uh, and I feel strongly that the auditorium project should be included in the budget, um, mainly because it's um, been on the table for so long. Um, and the uh, upgrades that it represents are ha have been needed for so long, um, and, and uh, people have been very patient uh, waiting for so long uh, to have those uh, improvements made when they, you know, the idea was they were going to be made as part of the earlier bond raising, and they weren't uh, for reasons that, you know, aren't really anyone's per fault per se. But uh, that all being said, uh, I feel strongly personally that um, we owe it to the community uh, of students, um, you know, those who uh, use the, the auditorium to uh, make the improvements that have been promised now for a number of years. Um, so I do feel strongly about that. Um, I have less of a f fully formed view on the kinds of measures that should be taken to, you know, narrow the budget gap. I don't view the auditorium as something that should be, you know, played played with in in that kind of a. Uh, I guess uh, process as you mentioned drew I, I think that should be considered separately um, I don't have a strong reaction against the cost saving um, mechanisms that were discussed I do think we owe it to the community to narrow the gap that we are you know, above <laughs> the, the tax gap that we're that we come in with on, on our budget we can't be cavalier about it I think we have to do the best we can to to get it as close as we can making the cuts that we feel like we can um, that we feel would not um, expose us um, in any way or you know materially uh, worsen the experience of our students and teachers and those who use our buildings and our facilities so I think you know and I assume that uh, careful thought has been put into that in what was proposed and so I, I guess again I don't have a strong feeling about embracing all those things or not mm -hmm. um, but I you know I think as long as the gu guideline of you know Judiciousness has been used. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, I would support those kinds of uh, cost-saving mechanisms. Did you have any thoughts on the reserves as well? well no, I'm including reserves in okay. everything I said about the w methods to get the to get it down. To get it down. Okay. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I. Jim, you kind of summed it up for me. I agree. I, I really would hate to not move forward with the auditorium project. I feel like we owe it to the students and the community to do whatever we can to try to make it work. Um, I'm looking at these numbers, so I, I, part of me is still processing everything because not fun. Like, I'm just trying to figure out how to 
make it all work, <laughs> which I'm sure you know better than me. Um, so if you feel like these cuts that you suggested are um, are the best way to go and they don't hinder the experience our students are going to get and the educational goals we have for them, then I'm in, I'm in full support of it. Like Jim and Colleen, I'm uh, uh, eager to get the auditorium renovated and get the work started as far as how to go about doing it. You know, I want to keep an open mind uh, about that, but I, you know, strongly believe in doing the work and doing it quickly, so um, there's that. Um, I'm also um, a little leery about cutting too much into our, our reserves. Um, just, I, I, I think, um, uh, you know, maybe I'm just conservative by nature. You know, I, I, I think um, it's important to have um, the right now. The maximum is four percent for undesignated fund uh, reserves. Um, there's actually uh, proposals out there, um, you know, to actually raise that number. That a lot of uh, people don't feel like even four percent is enough. Um, I think uh, that was something in a, on, on the West Putt call I was on last week um, as b being something that people are advocating for to raise that. To ten percent, so you know, you know, I don't know that that's what other other people are are thinking. Uh, maybe it's useful for us to consider as well. Uh, not necessarily going to ten percent, but just knowing that other people feel like having um, healthy reserves are important. Susie, I think that's really an important point about the reserves. Um, I agree with what others have said about the auditorium, but I, I feel a little torn because I feel like we definitely have a strong obligation, a responsibility to our students to go ahead with finishing the project, but I also do feel like we have a very strong fiduciary responsibility to the community to do it in the smartest way possible. And so, to you know, I know that real study has gone in to the auditorium, but I think now might be a time to reconsider the project to make sure we can get it done, but to make sure we can get it done with community buy-in. So perhaps that does mean eliminating or changing certain parts of the project scope. And I just wanna make sure that we're really mindful so that, we, um, that we're doing it in responsibility to sort of all of the stakeholders. What can I just ask? What would signal that? What would signal that we've um, in reconsidering the project? What would what would signal that we've done it in the smartest way possible? Sure. So, like one of one of the I'm just saying because I just said like, which I try to never do. <laughs> the board table. Um, every English teacher in the audience is grimacing. I'm so sorry, um, but. One of the things, for example, would be to have a real handle on how significant the acoustic differences are. So is, you know, we had the acoustic engineer come in. Will that make a difference to spoken word performance, to musical performance? Who are the greatest beneficiaries from that? Like, Or will it just generally be a truly significant, appreciable um, difference for all auditorium users. You know? So I thought we heard the answer to that is yes, unequivocally. I, is the issue how do we convince yeah, people how do we, of that? I think, I think maybe how do we convince people of that? How do we know that what we're really getting in the auditorium project is not only the things that I think are really clear to the naked eye, which are improved dressing rooms, a ceiling that isn't chipping, you know, a seating, seating that isn't damaged. Um, but also, when we put in the acoustic tiles, and you know, for for example, when Dr. Graybill was talking about the flooring for the dances. That is a tangible, easy thing for me as a non-engineer to grasp. I understand that with the current flooring, it is difficult to have dance performances, and that with improved flooring, they will be able to have dance performances. That's very clear. It is harder for me to grasp when we put in these tiles, which are 
a fairly significant part of the overall project cost, what real benefit will our students derive from that? And maybe the answer is overwhelmingly, yes, it's a huge benefit, and we should not do the project without it. And I'm completely willing to hear that answer and learn from it and move forward with that. But um, I, I guess I hadn't felt like I had heard that unequivocal yes yet. But I'm, I, I absolutely support the auditorium project. I just want to make sure that we are mindful of the scope of the project. Uh, yeah, my, my question is really more process and steps. I guess um, what, what is confusing me a little bit is do we not need to hear the information on March 6th in order to get the full picture to, to give you input? I'm like confused because it seems like we've reviewed stuff and we learned stuff today. Um, for me, it's a little, I'll be honest, slightly overwhelming, the, the, the amount of data. Um, but I thought, okay, great, now I can take a breath and we're going to get the, f the other half next time. So I'm a little taken aback that I have to comment when I feel, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding the direction you need, but it feels like we need to finish the, the presentation so that we have the full picture. Again, if I'm, if I'm misunderstanding this, correct me. But I mean, I know you, you want the input, but I, I, I'm not sure I feel comfortable giving it at this point. I feel like I want to know a little more before I say anything else. So again, maybe I'm, I'm just getting myself in a tizzy over nothing. I think um, that's totally reasonable. Um, if there are specific things you want to know more about that we have already talked about, not those which we haven't, right. that would be helpful. Like even without any other direction, that, that would certainly be helpful. What you're going to hear next time, um, aside from either being directed in one direction or another tonight, or some fundamental changing. So let's say we learn, oh my gosh, we're actually getting 500,000 more in state aid than we thought, which is not going to happen. But <laughs> let's say that happened. That's a fundamental that we would come back and report to you next time. And that could change the gap. It could change a, a bunch of different things. But aside from that, everything you're going to hear on March 6th is baked in to the budget, all right, to the numbers. You're just going to hear detail from uh, Edgar about the, the curriculum and instruction program and where our program improvement dollars will be directed, um, that we're continuing the math support for the reveal um, program, that we're how we imagine um, supporting the continued learning around social emotional support for kids. So you're going to hear detail of what's, what's already in the numbers that you have heard. You're going to hear detail from facilities, from special ed, and then from uh, technology. So, so for example, we're not going to, there's not going to be another round of potential suggestions on ways to reduce. If you said tonight, overwhelmingly, the board said, don't come back unless you've got an, a budget that shows a dollar amount that's under the tax levy limit. If you if that, I'm just using that as an example, if that was the direction you gave us, we would come March 6th having to show at least an additional $800,000. Do I have that number right? Sorry. Yeah, yeah $830,000 in reductions or application of, of uh, fund balance uh, of reserves. I would say I'm, like, I think a takeaway we're starting to have is we really need to be judicious with the reserves. That's part of the message we're hearing, and we're going to go back, think about, and come back to you with, OK, we've proposed TRS, ERS, and health. Here's why we stand by that and think your concerns are mitigated. Or here's why we don't. <laughs> here's why we're going to adjust those a little bit or something like that. I'm just giving examples of how your input influences us and then what we come back with. 
Okay, th that's helpful. Thank you. So um, maybe you could just clarify a little bit for me, not reducing the tax levy, that $830,000 that we're over. One scenario is if we were, we could say to you, very interesting budget, now come back with a budget that figures out how to reduce that $830,000, which would certainly make us debate certain things which may or may not be an interesting exercise. But I guess what I'm not clear is not reading, meeting that requirement what is the implication? Ah, great question. So I, I thought we were going to get to that. I'm sorry. So a pr it's very simple. I think it's simple. A proposed budget that exceeds the allowable tax levy yes. requires a supermajority vote of the public, 60 percent, yes, oh, okay. to pass the budget. Okay. I didn't you can adopt that. You can adopt any budget you want that would go before the voters, but a budget that's over the levy limit requires a supermajority, as opposed to a, a levy that's at or under the limit only requires 50% plus one um, vote. So theoretically, okay. I, 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 Good question. Sorry. I, I, great I, question. I, yeah. should have I mean, been much I, more explicit. I, about I, I, yeah. Okay. Apologize. I think historically we have been told that, but I forgot. So if, for example, we, we, we say, you know what, this all makes sense. Let's proceed. We're 830000 over you know, fingers crossed we get our 60%. And let's say we don't, and the message is from the community, hello, we have an inflation, we don't want to see this. I guess there's a part of me, and, and, I, and I'm, being, I'm trying to be very cautious to generate work, you know, extra work, but I think one way of ensuring that we get 60%, if we go this way, is to show the implication of if we don't. So if I were the community, I'd want to say, if you were to say, look, you know, we can do it. We can get rid of 830000 but you're not going to have that additional special education teacher. You're not going to have blah, 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 which, you know, we're going to debate a little bit, you know, but you're going to propose. That way, I, I think that's an argument. Otherwise, I mean, maybe other people are sitting there like me thinking, hmm, I wonder if I really pushed them what that 830000 which – out of the whole budget, I'm not saying it's peanuts, but you know, yeah. you, no, it 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 it, it sounds totally, feasible. Totally so I, I guess you know, if other people agree, I would like to see what that eight hundred thirty thousand would be because we may be asked by people in our community who don't want to approve a budget, you know, over the cap, like you know. So again, I I'm just my perspective. Totally. Thank you. With respect to that, the 60%, um, if we don't get the 60%, it's my understanding that there's an opportunity to do a revised budget. It is my understanding, excuse me, sorry, if we don't get the 60% um, approval, that there's a period of time in which the district can submit a revised budget for a second vote. For a second. Correct. And if that doesn't carry the second vote, then it's a contingency budget, which I think is down to what the prior if, budget was. if you, and I would want to double check this and I could present it at the next meeting, but I believe if you go with a budget that's above the cap again, above the levy limit again on that second vote and it fails, then your levy is uh, must stay the same as the current year. So it's extremely uh, penal. Um, and, or you can go with a regular, you know, a reduced budget below the cap. Um, for a second chance, and if it passes, it passes. Well, I recall that's what happened the last time we went over the scores that went over the the, gap, uh, the cap. That was uh, a revised budget had to be presented, um, which turned out to avoid the contingency. I think this situation and that situation are very different. I think that situation, um, if I recall correctly, was more about uh, sort of a, a, a athletic like sort of improvement to the athletic facility and fitness called, center. Fitness center. Um, and and I think this, uh, at least in terms of the auditorium project, which I know is not the ca tax cap thing, but in terms of you know a big a big highlight, it's just been on the ra in right radar for so long. But um, I don't disagree with what Bob suggested. I mean, I you know I know it's a lot more work for you guys. I'm a little worried that if our position is we've already done all the work, 
to sh to to have a below the but uh, cap budget that's kind of kind of going to be well then why not just go there and i mean i don't know pe maybe people are going to hear okay we won't have another special education teacher and they'll just say i don't care i mean i think we as a board know we need it i think uh the district knows it needs it but i'm not quite sure you know um if you put this decision on each thing you're gonna to cut to each person in the community, whether they have the same kind of fiduciary responsibility to think of the entire big picture that we do. I, I mean, think that is our job, right? So, and I'm sorry, Ron, because you haven't had a chance to speak yet, So, but I think that is our job. And this is where I, I agree with Bob's idea in terms of I wanted to know what else we could cut. Um, I don't know that I want to cut the other things that we could cut, but I want to understand what the trade-offs are before I say that we're willing to go over the tax cap because I feel like as a board, we need to understand what those trade-offs are and we need to be confident in our decisions and we need to be able to stand up to the community if we are going to go over the tax cap and we need to be able to say, we need these eight hundred extra $800,000 for this reason. To me, that's important especially if we're going over the tax cap. So that is that is why I, I agree with Bob's idea. And, you know, Jim, I, yes, the community might say, yeah, you don't really need, you know, a contingency special education. It's our job to explain why that's important if that's what we decide to do. So, sorry, Ron, please go ahead. Thanks. I really enjoyed listening to this discussion. <laughs> it gave me all the time to clarify my thoughts, so thank you. Um, so starting with um, the auditorium, for me, the key factor is doing this project right. Um, how we fund it, I f feel more flexibility on. This is a project for the next 40 years. I think the last time the auditorium was really renovated was 40-ish years ago. I, I don't want to be looking back 10 years from now and feeling like we had this chance. Th this is the chance. What we do now is going to be what the auditorium is for 40 years. Um, I think we should do it right. I could go either way about whether we keep it in the budget, whether we bond it separately, uh, whether we bond it partially. Um, and I think that gets back to Amber's sort of big point, which is we would need to explain to the community if we bonded it why we feel $4.7 million on a bond is worth doing for the next 30 years, or if we keep it in, why the budget number is big, bigger than the tax cap number, things like that. Um, in terms of the cost savings uh, that have been proposed already, um, they seem thoughtful, they seem reasonable. I do think we need to be cognizant of the tax cap. I'm going to give you my thoughts in a minute of the tax cap, but I'm realistic about um, you know what amount we can realistically go over, because while it is this board's decision, um, of what we propose to the community. Ultimately, it is the taxpayer's decision whether to pass the budget or not. Um, the schools must go to the community. So in terms of the tax cap, and I just want to sort of talk out my thinking because I sort of leads into where I think about um, other things like the reserves or whether I feel the need to see other, uh, what it would take to get us to the tax cap. I mean, I, I, I like to think about why is this tax quote cap exist I mean, this was a mechanism to reduce the rate of property taxes in New York State. What this was not, and is not anywhere considered in the calculation, is what the community views as the right level of funding for education of their students. Um, that was left up to each individual community by the decision to override the cap. So we can go under it, we can go over it. It's really up to each community's decision. It is not really a cap, it is a, uh, number to keep property taxes low, which is fine, but it's um, not necessarily linked to what a community wants in terms of education for students. I think that is the question we want, or to me that is what I want to think about and what guides me. Um, so to that point, um, I do think there is value in expressing what happens if you want to go under the cap. I think Bob made a good point. It's an exercise that we did do as a board during COVID when there was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we did not know what was going to happen. And we looked at a lot of options. Stuart did a lot of work to present different options. Um, Drew did a lot of work on staffing. At that point, the board came back and said to the community, to do some of these draconian things was going to eat into our educational programs. And we affirmed we did not want to do that. 
I think that exercise was valuable. I know it was valuable as a board member. I think it was valuable for the community to know this is what it means if you want to get to a certain number. Um, I don't know what the 800,000 entails, but I think it's worthy of having a discussion um, because that will then help us articulate to the community why we are proposing to go over the cap or not or why we are proposing to bond or not. Um, and then the last piece you asked about was reserves. Um, I, I wouldn't take from my questions that I'm concerned about our reserves. My trepidation is to make sure we've thought through if we use reserves this year and next year is a tough year, then what? Yeah. Um, and what does that mean in terms of our ability to um, to have flexibility? I mean, I think one of the values that we have in this community is we have a community that funds public education very strongly, so that allows us to deliver new programs all the time. So. I, I, would, I just don't want to box us into a place where we can't continue to do that. Um, so I, I don't have the expertise to know whether we think health insurance is, you know, the, you have a lot more experience, and Carol's a lot more experience of what's underlying this big increase. If you're comfortable that, you know, yes, we can use some, for, some reserve for next year because we're less worried about such a big hit, or if it happens, this is our plan, then I would be more comforted in that. I'm not against necessarily using them, um, given that this is a tough year for various reasons, while we still want to deliver education to our community. That's my thoughts. Um, I didn't touch upon the auditorium, but I also support including the auditorium um, either as part of the budget or potentially as a bond. I think that's something that's kind of interesting to me to think about. I'm not sure that I have a decision on it, but it's something. So we've given you a lot of, do you have enough? I think, I th so I'm gonna replay what I think I, we have. So um, at the very least, we would come back next time showing you um, our best thinking about a combination, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw some language out there. Um, I, the word cuts I think is too blunt. Um, things we might postpone doing things we might tighten or reduce, or things we might eliminate. And that's really the most, the most extreme. But some combination of those things in addition to what we showed you tonight that reduce that gap to, uh, to the tax cap level. Um, a second thing I think we heard was uh, come back giving more detail about um, our thinking related to the use of reserves. What are we basing those uh, recommendations on do we stand behind them and what do we see in the out years uh, if things go right or maybe if things go wrong what what impact um, I think that's what we heard I don't think we have a, a firm answer on um, you know where the board is with whether the auditorium project would be included in the budget but right now I think we hear don't don't necessarily take it out at this point is that I think you've synthesized that discussion very well, Drew. Thank you. The audience probably really appreciates that, too. Yeah, I think we could come back with some more detail on the options for the auditorium, like what it would mean with uh, you know, a bonding scenario, just to put some dollars to it. Okay, okay thank you. I, I, can, just one, my, my own, um, I guess, bias from an architectural head, head, head point is in, in architecture, we have the expression, the cut and the bleed technique. So the, this is when you're talking about a program. I would, ra I, I would rather think also about reducing a program versus eliminating a program. So for example, you may want to, and, and maybe there are political implications, you may want to put new furniture in all of the second grades and it's going to cost $100,000 but maybe we agree we're gonna do one school a year as, instead of all five. So we reduced 100,000 to 20. We, we keep moving on the effort, but we bleed, meaning we reduce it, but we don't cut it. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a way of looking at it. So I think the technology lease is a good example of that. Yes, right, so I mean, I would rather keep moving on the programs, but almost try and reduce them and spread it out. Say, yeah, we wanted to do it in one year, but maybe we'll do it in three years. 
and figure out a way to do that. So I think that keeps our kind of foot in the water with moving on certain things. It's just a bias that I personally have. And just that triggered a thought in, in my head, which is just to be clear, if that $830,000 gap that we've left off tonight were clear and easy, we would have come forward with that tonight. So. I think that's a good point to make, Drew, because I think that, you know, asking you to come back with those kinds of proposals, it will hopefully be clear to this board whether we want to move forward with that or not. So thank you. I appreciate the work that you're about to put in.